So we have an hour. So we're starting at 1.15 and uh, we'll finish by 3. Is that okay? So uh, the last 15 minutes will be taken by my friend uh, Dr. Kevin John who will be taking you through the, the maze of exams. So I will not be talking about exams. I've done enough exams in my life. I'm done with them. I don't want to hear about them. I don't want to do another exam all my life. Right? I've been writing them all along, proving myself again and again and again. I'm worth being a doctor, right? So I'm done with that. And uh, you might know Philip Finney, he smashed every academic records in, in CMC by law. He's four years below me and uh, he's one of the legends of uh, CMC by law sitting before you, right? So, let me start with a story. Stories are best when they're related from the most recent past. Just yesterday was Diwali, right? Diwali, the last working day before Diwali. So there was, in comes this farmer representative. You know, I work in a private hospital. So in comes this farmer representative with a big packet in his hand. So both this poor chap keeps the bag on the ground. He, he opens this large gift wrapped thing out of his bag. <coughs> and he says, sir, this is for you. I said, what is this? He said, it is a, I don't know what it is. It's, you know, it's in a package. So it's a Diwali gift for you. It's a lamp. It's a obviously a very expensive lamp. What would you do if you were me? Option A. Take the lamp, take it home. Hey honey, see what I got? Take it home. Option B. Okay, so how many will take option A? I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to worry, you're not, you're not on TV, I'm on TV, you're not on TV. No one's looking at you. Why would I accept a gift from a farmer company? Why? Hey, you can tell me, it's okay. You can disagree with me, I don't have any problem. In fact, I love people who disagree with me. Any thoughts? How many would refuse it? One, two, three, four. Five, six. How many would accept it? One, two, three. Okay. Now, the reason I became a doctor is not to accept a gift from pharma companies. I don't want them. I mean, I'll write their products if they are worthwhile writing. But in return for writing a product, do you think it is ethical to accept a physical gift? It may be a park, a pen. Do you think that's correct? So this farmer rep happens to know me, he's a personal friend, so he knows me. So he said, sir, I understand, I will take it back. But he, he is, he is duty bound to give it to me, all right? But he knows my soham, so he quietly took it out of my room. And I said, you take it home, consider it my gift to you, because I will not accept it. So that is story number one. Now, I just related to you what happened yesterday. Now this is something that is happening to our medical profession at all levels throughout the world. It's not just in Kerala. Now that takes us back to the first question I said, why did I become a doctor? So do you, do you feel entitled? You can always argue and say, look, you know, I'm writing his product. So his company's making a profit. So he's just giving me a compliment. In my days in the US, I used to go for conferences and I've seen who own, you know, big mansions and Ferraris and all that. They'll walk through conference exhibition halls, picking every pen they can grab, gleefully putting it into their pocket and their hands will be full of these freebie bags and they'll be walking around like they want something at a fun fair. And I, on the other hand, will be walking hands-free. I'm just looking at the products and just learning about them. So I want you guys to have the courage to say no to bribe. Do you have the courage? If you don't have it, get it today. You are a doctor. Your job is not like anybody else's job. Your job is heal. And the moment corruption gets in, corruption arrives to you, it doesn't wear a mask and horn or wings or anything like that. Corruption 
is actually a very pretty person, very likable person that is around us all the time. So they will come to you in different guises. But regardless, at least you guys, I want you to just make a decision that you became a doctor not to accept somebody's freebie. You will earn a living. I'm not asking you to be poor. You'll earn a living by seeing patients, by performing operations, but not through pride of any kind. It can be a pen, it can be a... Come on, how much does a pen cost? How much does these, do these freebie pens cost? Three rupees? Why would you as a doctor go and grab it? It's a problem with our mindset. We feel entitled. We feel entitled to grab all, all the freebies that are thrown at us. So, so I'll just leave you with that thought. The second story I'll come to in the second half of my talk. So a little bit about me as you heard. This is where I started my uh, medical training. And um, from Vellore, after, just like Kevin, finished my MD in medicine, went to Belfast in uh, UK, that's in Northern Ireland. People know Belfast? Yeah, you know Belfast? Beautiful town, that's my hospital. And then I went to Newcastle, um, I'm sorry, went to Newcastle, that's in England, and then went to New York, and then Pennsylvania, now I'm back in Cochin. So I've been back in India for 10 years. So that's my story. So to start by, Let's start the session by asking, by giving an agenda. This is what I want to cover. Now, number five, number four, there's no time for that because I just don't have time for it. So maybe at another time. But that's a two hour module in itself. That's a different module here. Yeah. So I've included everything for you. There's, there was a fifth one which I took out, but then since we don't have much time, I've taken out the fourth as well. So we'll cover these three. One, the special qualities of successful people. Successful people all over the world have certain specific qualities. And what are these qualities? I'll tell you. And number two, how to become a global citizen. A global citizen is not somebody who lives in Tiruvalla or in Tiruvannadavaram or Chennai or someplace. A global citizen is a person who is accepted all over the world. The way you walk, the way you talk, the way you behave, everything must be acceptable, acceptable to anyone anywhere in the world, whether it's in Japan or whether it's in Austria or New York. So I'll take you through that. And so we'll go straight away to section one. I'll take you to professional skills, that is profession related skills. Now Ram, Ram are you here? All right, Ram and I were talking yesterday and then he said that there's a level of frustration among the community that the doctor profession is not so noble anymore. How many believe that the doctor profession is not noble? You can, show, you, can, you can disagree with me, you can show of hands. So do I take that everybody believes it's a noble profession? Okay, show of hands, how many believe it's noble? All right, so nobody's sleeping, good, good on you. I completely agree with you. There is nothing unnoble about our profession unless we individually and collectively decide to make it unnoble, if there's such a word. So promise me, you will not do that. And uh, this is something we frequently forget. We are the guardians of modern medicine. And modern medicine didn't happen in a day. It happened over centuries and centuries of work. Whenever you see these silly quiz programs with those old people with big beards and say, who is this? You know, I hate those questions, by the way. But it is those people that built it. And we are just standing on their shoulders and we're just looking at the world with a degree. So an MBBS degree is, to me, it is the biggest degree in the world. Trust me. And I honestly believe, I believe it when, I'm, when I say it, MBBS degree is absolutely the best degree a human being can get in the world. Now, if you, if you wish to have qualifications after that, it's your prerogative. But if you have an MBBS degree, you've arrived. You ask somebody. That's modern medicine. So we live in a negative-centered society. People talk ill about everything. People will talk ill about the government. People talk ill about the weather, about about movie industry, about music, politics, everything. They talk ill similarly about our healthcare profession as well. There are a few bad apples here and there who are causing some problem. But you know what? Bad apples are there everywhere. We just don't have to be one of them, right? All right. Okay. 
I am so happy that the Indian Medical Association has a strong presence. That's my unit. I'm the president now of the Indian Medical Association Kuchin chapter, one of the most prestigious branches in the country. You see the power of that picture? And it is not they, Indian Medical Association, it's not they, it is us. All of us together, that's, that's them. It's not like, you know, on their radio or it's not like Rotary Club. It is us. It is the modern medicine profession. So, thanks again for that. So here's an open question. How do you define success as a doctor? Because we are going to become doctors at some point. How do you define success? Any takers, you want to say something loud? Learn, all right? You are not speaking because you're afraid what other people will think of you. I want you to unlearn that habit today, now. Will you do that for me? I do not want anyone to think, oh, just don't do that, all right? That's the first thing and one of the biggest things that's holding back doctors and citizens of our country. You know the old joke, where you Malayali today, Jeevitam. Anyone who doesn't follow Malayala? Okay, I'll translate it for you. Where you Malayali today, Jeevitam. There are three lines. Can anyone guess those lines? Jananam. Machulla Rendu Parayam. Maranam. You get it? So the Malayali is born. Throughout the life, the person lives Machulla Rendu Parayam. And then he dies, he or she dies. So I want you to unlearn that habit. Don't worry about what other people, as long as you believe you're doing the right thing, you know what, it's perfectly fine. So now with that intro, how do you define success as a doctor? Anyone? Thank you to you. I love that. When a patient says thank you, a big applause for this gentleman. I believe you've spoken for all of you. So I'm sure all of you Agree with him? What's your name? Hannah. Hannah, Hannah. Hannah, yeah. Thank you so much, yeah. So again, I know that habit takes a little bit of time to unlearn. Promise me you'll unlearn that habit. Don't worry about what your neighbor is. Don't do that, all right? Okay, I'm picking on you. You're the one that looked, him, looked at him. All right, <laughs> good. That's, that's the problem with our, our society, you know? Because I've been to Countless schools, countless colleges, countless institutions. You ask a question, everybody's like, <laughs> I'm like, what's up with that? It's you I'm asking, all right? So I know that a crowd behaves as an organism. You're now behaving like a single unit. You know, I give you that, but unlearn that habit. Don't worry about the other person, right? So let's see the parameters. Parameter number one, how many think Monthly earnings is a parameter of success. Doctors are rich, right? Yeah. Rich. Being rich. They love this parameter. When they come and see their patients, they want to see a large crowd outside the room. And that is success for them. Large house. Oh, gate. You know those big palatial gates? You want one of those? Hey, there's nothing right or wrong. I'm just asking you. Do any of you define that as a success point? How about a new German automobile? That new car smell? and the thud of the heavy steel doors closing. Some just leather seats with a massage. Yeah, success, successful doctor. This is what other people, you know, I'm not talking about, you guys are the good guys, right? You're the good guys. These others outside us, outside the room, these are accepted parameters. Freebies and gifts from pharma companies. very common. It's accepted practice. Accepted practice doesn't make it right. Right, Philip? Just because people do it. Bribe is an accepted practice. Do you think that's right? No. Bribe is never right. Giving it or receiving it is wrong. My, my father stood by it. He was the head of HMT. And I'm his son. I've stood by it. 
will never take or receive or give a bribe, right? Will never offer a bribe either. Those are values, right? Those are values. Henna mentioned quality of our work. So I believe those who define their success as the quality of their work will remain successful and will remain happy. Remember, to be successful, you need to be happy, right? And what defines happy is what you set as your goal. If you set your goal as the number of patients waiting to see you, suppose the next, suppose a new doctor opens up a clinic next door, your number of patients is going to drop by half. You're going to become unhappy for no good reason. Is it worth becoming unhappy for that? You continue to see a half number of patients. A third doctor comes next door, your, your volume will drop by one third. That's okay. Simple math. Should you be unhappy? That is why parameter number two is wrong. Large house. You build a large house, you know, you take a loan, you know, you work, you go to Middle East, you make some money. You build a large house, you know what? Three years later, Avarachan has built a much larger house on the other side of the road, which larger gates than yours. You've seen that? You see it on, just take a drive through Trivella. You've seen that. Chakochan will build a house here. Three years later, Avarachan's house will be 50% bigger. Now, large German car, okay, you, you buy a Mercedes C-Class, beautiful vehicle. Burger Chayan will buy a BMW 5 Series, yeah. And Mama the next door will buy, a, he'll buy a Jaguar. So you'll never be happy, okay? You'll never be happy if you have a large, if this as your goal. I'm not saying you should not have a nice car. Nothing against cars here. The problem is if you set the benchmark of success as one of these, then you're in trouble. So that is one of the fundamental messages I wanted to give you guys. And uh, I'll give you a disclaimer. I don't have a house. I live in a room. My wife and I, we live in a room. We live with our parents, my parents, who are old. Take care of them. We have a room upstairs. We're pretty happy with, I think we are. Room. When our friends come, we go to our room, we entertain them, we come out of the room. That's how we live. I, I drive an old second-hand car. It looks nice, but it's an old car. That's my life for you, all right? So, I am the man who walks the talk, so I just want you to know that. You might think I'm living in this riverside mansion and maybe giving you the speech. No, I live in a room. I'm the only doctor in Cochin that actually lives in a single room. All right. So, what connects these three? There's a single feature that is common between the iPhone, the Rolex, and the Porsche. Quality. These are the world's top quality products. And quality did not come in a day. It must have taken them a long, long time to achieve that. So that's why I said, if quality is your benchmark, you're going you're gonna to be, you're going to, you're going to spend a long time achieving it and you're going to enjoy doing that. You know this car? Some of you have seen it. My father, my father used to have one. This car died. Why did it die? It died because they did not reinvest the profits into quality. They thought they could live forever selling a crappy car which is not even worth, you know, 5,000 rupees. They sold it for an astronomical amount of money and all the profits they made, I don't know what they did with the profit. You see this laptop or this phone, you know, all the money goes into R&D. They do R&D, they make their next year's product that much better. So that is what I want you to invest in. I want you to invest in quality in yourself. I want you to invest in yourself. That's a word I use, invest. Of course, there's a fine medical college, but there are so many other skills that you can learn, and I want you to continuously invest in that. So that's your quality improvement. And it is basically a central management strategy in healthcare. So here's the doctor's quality, here's the doctor's quality. 
you can call it healthcare outcome quality. I know I sound like an MBA professional now, I'm not. I'll tell you something. If you take patient satisfaction as a quality parameter, you think just because you are a fine doctor, you think patient quality will, patient satisfaction will happen? Can you tell me some of the other factors? Come on. You're a fine doctor, but your patient is not satisfied. What could be the reason? Lack of? Lack of communication. Very good. Any other thoughts? Does the worker, does the doctor work alone? So what could I, I give you a clue? Yes, that's the word, the team. Be very careful when you build your team. You may be the finest surgeon or physician or gynecologist or whoever you call it, researcher. If you have a lousy team, the outcome will not be good. So that is a very important, very important skill. You got to make sure that all these aspects are covered. See, a patient satisfaction can be covered. It can be affected by the courtesy of the staff, the cost of your care, the ambience, the expectation. The patient may come with a certain expectation. If that expectation is not met, dissatisfaction is a result. So don't be under the impression that you've got the top marks in Believers Medical College. You'll be the best doctor. No. A lot of your real life outcome depends on the factors around your workplace. So I want you to know how to choose your workplace well. All of us have different temperaments. It will not be possible to get the ideal job first. You will go through various jobs, but at some point you will want to settle in a place that gives you a chance to work as a team to promote good quality. I know Dr. George Chandy, he believes in the principle of teamwork. So that's a, that's a well-known principle. So, very powerful slide. Never ever forget this. This slide will follow you till the day you die as a doctor. What does the slide show? It shows powerful steel links to a chain which is connected with a paper clip. Where will the chain break? It will break at the paper clip. Now I see it all the time in my work. Again, what you said, team. If you have one lousy team member, it doesn't have to be a doctor. It could be a receptionist. No matter how strong you are as a doctor, how, how ethical, how you know fantastic you are as a doctor, the outcome will be bad. The chain breaks. So remember, when you build a team, all the links, right from the security to the receptionist, to, the, your, to your nurse, to your technician, to your colleagues, everyone has to be good. So keep that in mind. So one bad team member can undo the good work of a lot of people. What I do in my department, my, when I founded the gastro division in my hospital, what this, this is my handwriting, this is my register, can you see that? These, I write handwritten notes, I love handwritten notes. We hold meetings with all the staff, we sit together as a group, we talk about the week that went by, we talk about the outcomes, the patient is other in agreements, what are the feedback, etc. So that is a fundamental quality maintaining practice. So whether you're sweeping the floor or teaching, aim for perfection. That is something I want you guys to do. Dr. Gangadharan briefly mentioned this, the fine art of failing. More than successes, we learn more from failures. Anyone, anyone disagrees with that? It is our failures. It is never pleasant to fail. Okay, I lost the, I think the, the quiz, the IAP quiz, we came second and I was devastated in CMC Villa. We lost to our juniors as final years. It was, a, you know, it was the lowest moment in my life when I look back, academically speaking. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Because you, you know, we could not fail. We could not fail, but we failed. We failed in front of the whole college. So, but failures teach a lot more. So, Whenever you make mistakes from your work, be humble to accept them. Our initial re reaction, trust me, I didn't do it. It's someone else. It's someone else. It, it, it can't be me. No, no. I, that's not me. Accept your failure because all of us, anyone who has treated a patient, we've all made a mistake. Not one mistake, but several mistakes. Mistakes will happen. But what's more important is you accept it, acknowledge it, and learn from it. So that's what I call the 
fine art of failing. Failing is a man-made word. You know, we make these terms in English or other languages for all. It is just an entity. Right? We just call it an entity. Don't give it the emotional connect. Fail has a profoundly negative impact, linguistic impact. So just take the failing part. Mistake also is a very negative term. All right. So I'll take you through the mind of a criminal. There was a study done in the UK, in the prisons of England. Somebody actually interviewed criminals who were sentenced for life. They were serving life sentences for horrible things they did, like murder and other heinous things. The person who did the study was a psychiatrist. His findings were remarkable. You know what the findings were? All of these people who committed these so-called heinous crimes, each of them appeared very calm, composed, polite, courteous, and more importantly, they all believed they did the right thing. That is the mind of a criminal. Now, criminals don't just belong inside prisons. There are people like that everywhere. I just don't want you to be one of them. What I'm trying to say is, you could be doing something profoundly wrong, you won't even know it. You may convince yourself, you may tell yourself, hey, you know, I'm doing the right thing. Just like the pharma company gift I mentioned about. Oh, I'm just writing his product. His company is making a margin and they're just giving me a present because they're happy. Why should I spoil their happiness by refusing a gift? That is how the mind works. Our mind can work, can play tricks on us. So I want you to know that. And the immunity to that is what I call a mission statement. Have you heard of this term, mission statement? Most reputed companies, the companies I showed you, they all have a mission statement. I'm sure the believers, Church Medical College has a mission statement. I want you to read it. You know our country has a mission statement? How many of you have read the Constitution? Homework for you. Right? Go and read the Constitution. Because the first thing an Indian citizen should know, we should know it like this by heart. All the clauses. Prompts me you will read the Constitution because our Constitution is the finest in the world because it was written more recently and it has collected all the good points from all the all the nations. It's a it's a fantastic piece. It's it's easily just uh, it's easily available. Just Google it. You can get a PDF of it. You can read it in five minutes. All right. So a mission statement is something that will protect us from doing the wrong thing. So that is my mission statement. This is my handwriting. I wrote this on day one of my department. That's now 10, 11 years old now. I'll show you an example. Number six, we will safeguard the privacy of our patients' information and treat them with privacy and dignity when they undergo endoscopic procedures here. That's clause number six. See how precise it is? We are, in, we are, we are a gastro unit, so obviously patients undergo invasive procedures. It's written down. And I've also written it down that none of my patients will suffer pain. So it's a written statement with my signature on it. That's powerful. So tomorrow I can't say, no, no. If I've written there's no pain, there will be no pain. That's what I meant by your mind will play tricks on you. The only way to stop your mind from playing tricks on you is to write a mission statement. Now this is a department mission statement. You could create a mission statement for yourself. I'm sure if there are 50 people in this room, each 50 of each one of you 50 will have a different mission statement. That's okay. But if you write it down, trust me, it's unlikely that you will fail. And then all doctors at some point will have a family. And uh, this is a slide I showed CMC Bellor when I gave a talk at CMC Bellor uh, in November. It's called the Wheel of Life. Seen this slide, anyone? It's called the Wheel of Life. Basically, I know these fonts are hard to read. If this is life, these are the spokes of a wheel. Can you see that? Yeah, these are the spokes. So that's your business or career. That's your business or career. So that spoke is this. Here's money, here's health, here's family and friends. Here's romance, here's romance. Yeah, this is time for romance. Personal growth, investing in yourself. Remember what I mentioned? Investing in yourself. 
fun and recreation. And like Dr. Gangadhar said, he plays a mouth organ. He, you know, he rides, he sees movies. Fun and recreation. Physical environment, working for for the country, for the planet. Now, all these are other aspects of our life. So, I've seen doctors do just patient care, patient care, patient care. There are many other aspects of being alive because you just live once. This is just a sample. You can create your own spokes, but just make sure they balance out a little bit. The problem is the person, the example I gave, that person will have a single spoke. The rest of it, there is no spoke. There's no wheel at all. The wheel doesn't run. So for life to run smoothly, all of these, we have to give time. We have to give protected time. I'll give you one example. Let's just say you go to a restaurant with your family. How many times have you been to a restaurant? I'm not talking about us. There's family on the next table. Family of four comes in. As soon as they come in, they do that with their mobile phones. It's happening around us all the time. We're getting increasingly disconnected. They didn't come for family time. They just came to have our calories and proteins and fats to be ingested. They came for ingestion. Hey, when you're with family, turn that device off. Look at your partner's face, your children's face. Talk with them. Smile at them. Smileys are fine, you know, when we are far away, but Promise me you'll do that. When you're with family, the device is off. When families, when you're alone, yeah, the device comes on. And talking of devices, don't let the device control you. You control the device. Keep that in mind. That's a long session, but I've summarized that entire session into one sentence. Don't let the device control you. You control the device. How many of you, how many of you use Siri every day? Siri? Oh, yeah, not that. All right. Now I can control my device just sitting here. I can use voice commands. I can I can make it. I can make the phone do anything I want. But back to the device. When you're with family, notifications are off. No chatting. Just give family time. Right. So again, that's the wheel of life. Personal growth, health, finances. Yes, money is important. Money doesn't come overnight, we have to. That's a completely different model. That'll take two hours. That's another of my modules. If you want to Google it, you can Google Rajiv J. Devan, finance or money, and you'll get probably the best article written about wealth from a doctor's perspective, because it's immensely researched, and uh, it'll take a long time to explain. So I'm not, I'm not even gonna go that, uh, do that right now, right? So I'll take you through some special skills which you will need in your life. This is an important skill. How many of you already know how to do that? Give me a tip, give me a tip, give me a trick, give me a trick you try. Come on. You do better than that. Where's the class rep? <laughs> <laughs> Looking at the direction of the pointing heads, the class rep is somewhere here. Is that you? There he is. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I, I promise I won't pick on you. Can anyone answer that? You said, tell me a trick you use. Come on, I'm, I'm going to tell you what I use, but I need to hear what you use. Tell me, yeah. Uh, when I used to talk to a person which I don't like, yes. I just hear what he's saying to me. Yes. And I always try to think that he is saying right, I am wrong. I always think so. Because he always believes he's right, right? Yeah. Lovely, yeah. Those people are always like that. They're really mean people. They always think they're right and everyone else is wrong. I, I also think that they are right. Good. I love what he said. You know, you taught me something today. I'm going to add that to my module. Hey, this is not Newton's law, all right? What's your name? Abhiram. Abhiram. Good on you. Yeah, thanks for teaching me. Round of applause for Abhiram. Just to paraphrase what he said, I'll just restate it for you. He said, if this jerk is talking to you, you give all the importance the jerk wants. Let the jerk say whatever they want. Oh, jerk, you're saying the right thing. <laughs> and I'm this lowly creature that had the privilege to listen to you. I'm so grateful for the time. <coughs> if you follow that attitude, that, that's, a, that's a real smooth approach. And you can go out and have a good laugh. <laughs> and use your digits. Yeah, all right. So there are books written about this. Because there's a recording, I can't tell you the name of the book. It's being recorded. 
It's called the Ultimate AH Guide. All right. The Ultimate AH Guide. All right. All right. The textbook method is, if the, so I'm talking about, I'm not talking about you at all. Yeah. <laughs> We're talking about the exact opposite of Dr. George Chandy. How to talk with somebody you don't like. I'm teaching them some special skills. To put it in one sentence, suppose a person who, who's talking to you, you know, you, you're, you're stuck with this person. I won't tell you what circumstance, but somehow you're stuck with me. You have no option but to work with this person or suffer this person's presence. What do you do? Yeah, you can, you can, you can do what Abiram said. You know, sir, you're right or madam, you're right. That's good. You could also add to that. You can focus on one good quality of this person. That person, no matter how bad a jerk that person is. There's got to be one good person. At least that person's got to be wearing a nice shoe. Just focus on the shoe, on the bloody shoe and say, you know, I love those shoes. You keep you keep telling yourself, I love those shoes. And make it show on your face. <sighs> yeah. And that person's going to like, wow, this person's really warming up to me. What? This person didn't like me at all. Now they're they in love with me or what? You're thinking about the shoe. And don't let them know that. Maybe that person will become a little less mean the next time and then you can think of the socks the next time as long as they don't smell yeah right so that's the tip for you so when you do that actually your face you know the face it tends to be less tight your muscles loosen up and the eyes will show a genuine smile as opposed to you know these smiles we make sometimes but the genuineness will come out the gleam will come in the eye so think about the shoe and here is another, again, this is a strictly, this is a personal invention. This is something I invented. Sometimes when you do something to, to someone, their response is so negative. This, you're like, ooh, where did that come from? I'm sure all of you have been through that. I'm like, ooh, why would somebody do that? Let's say you give somebody a birthday gift and they're like, and they say something nasty or they say something very sarcastic and you're like, oh, why do they even bother to do that? Have you ever wondered why they do that? So that is what I call the two box theory. I'll show you the two box theory. This is my personal invention. Now, if you say this without my name, I'll come and personally shoot you, right? This is my invention. This is my two box theory. Or how the a A person's behavior can be summarized in two boxes. His present behavior is profoundly influenced by what happened in that person's past. See, there are 50 people in this room. Each of us have had a different past. Even if there are twin sisters in this room, your past is not the same. We had a different, and what is, what is our past? Our childhood, our parents, if we are fortunate to have good parents, friends, our school, our teachers, our neighbors, people who, you know, who we talked with, the books we read, the television shows we saw, the movies we, we saw, our traumatic experiences, profound, yeah. That person's past trauma has a lot of influence on that person's perspective. But we don't know, we don't know what they suffered, right? We just see them as a person. Remember, they have had a past and it is that past that is making them behave like this. So we go around expecting people to behave exactly like us. It's gonna be a really boring world. So you're gonna be, ex you're going to be facing some surprises. So I'm just trying to explain it to you that there are so many variables that affect that surprising behavior. Remember, you're giving somebody a gift. I just use the gift as an example. You see this every day. You're like, oh, why did they say that? So again, um, the two box theory, whenever you're faced with a difficult person, remember that person has had a difficult past and uh, perhaps <coughs> you are the more fortunate. How many have read this book? I strongly recommend this book. There are plenty of self-help books out there which actually help only the author, but this particular one actually helps you. So don't go for silly self-help books because you're making the author rich. But this one is really good. And in that book, this is the most profound graph I've copied for you. It's called Centeredness of People. Again, 50 people here, we all have different centeredness. Some people 
are money center. Hey, nothing wrong with that. For them, everything is money. So when they, you know, when they go to a vacation, they'll be constantly thinking about how much their flight cost and how much savings would they have made if they booked the flight one hour uh, about two weeks prior. They'll be constantly thinking about that. And as they land, they'll look at, you know, should I take the bus or the taxi? Should I take the bus or the taxi? If I take the bus, I may take it, I may save a few dollars. Now for them, everything is money. And then there are some who work center. The average Indian doctor who wakes up at five in the morning and sees patients till one at night, work center. For them, they're happy. You know, we're not gonna correct them. They're just work center. For them, everything is work. Some people are enemy centered. You know what enemy centeredness is? Suppose you had a boyfriend. You broke up. And that boyfriend became your enemy. You spent the rest of your life relishing the bad things that happened to your boyfriend. <laughs> you know, he failed, he failed. You know, he broke up with another girlfriend. Great, yeah, I love that. You follow him, follow them on Facebook. You're like, yeah, he's not doing so good. He got fired from his job. See, that is called enemies. So your happiness is tied to your enemies' life events. So trust me, it happens. Some people are like this. There are people like this. And then there are, there are so many other centeredness. And Stephen Covey, exp Covey explains this beautifully in his book. His, his book has seven chapters and this is fabulous. This is like so deep. Stephen Covey goes on and says that the person who is the happiest is the person who is principle-centered. Remember I showed you a mission statement, a personal mission statement? 50 people, 50 different mission statements. But if it's written down, you follow that, you follow your principle. If society or your environment allows you to follow your principles, yes, you'll always be happy. You're following your principle. You don't worry about what happens to your enemy. You don't really care whether the flight is $100 more expensive or not. You don't care about whether you saw 10 patients or 50 patients, as long as the work is good. If you focus on quality, if you focus on principles, you're always happy. So as you look around your friends, you'll know you'll immediately see different center. When we look around our class, you see some people who are not very smart, who may not speak very well, and who are shy, who are poor at studies, or not good looking, they don't dress well, we look down upon them. And the rest of us who are like very savvy, who are smart, you know, who you know get high marks, we have that thing about us, yeah, we are better than them. But you're only 18. You never know what that person is going to become. That's something I want you to realize. Because these people who are sitting here, you may be 19 or 20, thereabouts. You never know what you're going to become in the future. But I'm not saying it's right or wrong here. If you do have that habit, get out of it. You can call an affectionate nickname, but not a derogatory nickname. So I, I don't think you will have that habit under Dr. George Chandi's leadership here, but if you do have it, delete it. Because, not just because it's unfair, it's also because you never know what that person's gonna be in the future. You may end up applying for a job in that person's department. You may end up getting a transfer based on an order given that, by that person. And people keep vengeance. So, I'm giving you real life, and this has happened before. Not here, but in Karnataka, right? So, again, treat each other with basic dignity. I think that is just not too much to ask for. Show respect, never insult. Never ever insult at least your fellow professional, never. This is something I, I'm the president of the Indian Medical Association Question Chapter. One of the founding principles I've written in my agenda is I will never insult another doctor because he or she is a professional. They deserve a basic level of, no matter how bad a deed they may have done, there's no need to insult them. I hope I'm right, Dr. George Hanley. So now that brings us to the most important decision in our life. Can someone tell me what's the most important decision in your life? We've got Kevin John waiting to tell you about USMLE and PLAB. Final MBBS, NEAT, exit test. 
What is the most important decision in your life? I see some smiles coming up. I think you're getting the hint. What PG entrance? What PG course? What state? Which medical college? What country to work in? Partner in life. No. Round of applause for Dr. Jaya Chandi. He's a partner in life. He nailed it. You can fail in your MBBS. You can fail. You can do whatever you want with your life. You can go to prison if you like, but you always come out of it. You're stuck with the wrong person. You're stuck for life. And no better time to know it than at your age. You might think, hey, it won't happen to me. It always happens to the next person. No. That's the, I'm a road safety trainer. That's the fundamental thing I teach when I teach road safety. Road safety is about us, not about them. So the same thing. I want you to think about yourself. When you find a partner, take your time. Make sure that that person is nice. You know, being nice is extremely important. Extremely nice. They must value you. They must be interested in hearing what you have to say. And they must deserve you. And uh, it must be someone who you can have a conversation with. Very important. Which is why I said, don't worry about what other people think. You make your decisions. You believe what is right. Just go ahead and do it. All right. So this is the most important message I want to leave you with today. Never ever underestimate the choice of a life partner. Because anyone else, your boss is nosy, you can always walk out. If you don't like the country you're working in, you can go to another country. But this you can't change. So, a little bit of brotherly advice to you. If you thought if you thought the world was a fair place, we always say, hey, it's not fair. Guess what? The world was never fair. Was it ever fair? It was never fair to anyone. So, this fairness business, just grow out of it. Nothing was ever fair, right? So, we'll skip that. And I'll take you through some lighter aspects of practice. So, I know many of you will be working abroad and I have a module coming up about how to survive abroad. And Kevin will appreciate that as well. On work-related matters, <coughs> remember I mentioned modern medicine? Precision. We are scientists. We don't want to use vague terms. Having worked in, having lived and worked in five countries, lived and worked, I tell you. People from our country use these terms all the time. I'll give you an example. Here's a medicine rounds happening in, let's say, New York City. The professor says, so what do you think is causing the patient's headache? The American resident says, migraine, because of associated vomiting. You know what the Indian resident would say, the typical Indian resident? Sir, I think it is probably migraine, because usually it can be associated with some vomiting. Sir, of course you don't say sir outside the country. Please, don't ever do that. Right, we'll, we'll get into that. I think, I think, you know that I think, what should you think? Does it matter what you're thinking? I, I'm just asking you what, I just asked you what you thought. I think it is probably migraine. Why do you want to say probably? Because usually you're qualifying it almost like a, you're putting a defensive clause some vomiting so we we throw in all these vague terms into our speech so get out of that habit sir i think it's probably migraine because usually it can be associated with some vomiting no, no. it's migraine because there is vomiting end of story right your professor will be happier trust me this happened to me i'm doing rounds at my hospital so i come out i'm writing notes on the bay you know that man who was in the last patient's room? I need to write, right? I need to write what that person was. Is he her husband? So I'm asking the nurse. Our room in the I mentioned, either patient or husband, I know. Can you ever guess the reply I got? Can anyone guess it? You've lived in Kerala long enough. <laughs> <laughs> 
ആണെന്നാ തോന്നുന്നേ മലയാളിസം ഫോർ യു This is classic Malayalism. They will not tell you, I don't know. It's taboo. No, no. No. You have to say something. For example, Is there a cold in the cold? Is there a cold in the cold? No, no, no. Is there a cold in the cold? Is there a cold in the cold? Again, classic Malayalism. I have done it. I am guilty of it. I grew out of it. So I am asking you, if any of you have similar traits, shed it here before you leave. Alright. So if, like the joke for about the neurosurgery resident, Dr. John Chandy knows the joke, it's an old CMC joke. There's a particular neurosurgeon, again I don't have to say names. If you ask this neurosurgery resident about a cow, the neurosurgery resident would tie the cow to a tree and talk about the tree it may work in india but you try it outside god save you all right so that's again a little bit of mentoring for those who are planning to become a global citizen with that intro will go to the global citizen are we go are we okay now we are flying out we are not confined to a country anymore So I'll, I'll summarize it to all the things I learned in my 13 years working in these five different countries. So this is profound life experience for you. So pay attention. Number one, the first thing you need to know when you visit a foreign country is not the language. You must know how to greet a person and more importantly, you must know how to respond to a greeting. You might think, oh, how did you do that? either came the like the salim kumar troll ah either came the no it's tough it took me 3 years to learn to respond to so how are you today i uh, i am uh, not having fever i am not in pain so how are you doing today doctor uh, i i am not i am okay that's the classic response i used to get i mean like, how are you in response the first my first visit to the us was a quick visit i wanted to buy these levi's jeans i heard about levi's jeans and i like, oh, first time i'm seeing them like, oh so i'm looking at this pair of jeans and in comes this big american woman walking towards me i'm like why is she walking towards me i'm supposed to go towards her she's just taller than me she's like big grin on her face like she knew me all her life like, ooh why is she smiling at me she comes and says So how are you doing today? <laughs> I never imagined such a greeting. You know, I, I was I was working in England for 3 years before I did that visit. I'm like I was totally shocked. I I, I couldn't say a word. I'm like <laughs> That's all I could say. So, practice with your colleagues. How are you doing today? Good, thank you. and a story or you can say good how are you oh, good and you good thanks so it's it's got you got to have that flair when you talk with people they're not asking you about your temperature or pulse rate or you know oral or otherwise no no they just are, it's just a greeting you know people are brought they just smile at you like naturally they smile at you in kerala is really good girl don't try smiling at strangers yeah. <laughs> not a feminist but just cuz i also teach self defense dr johnson he knows that's another two hour module i'll come back to that self defense is different yeah. don't smile at strangers right. so knowing to greet is number 1 number 2 is to be direct in conversation i already already gave you the example ada street a husband ana Are you sorry? Did you want me to find out for you? End of story. All right. 
ലൈം സംബഡി കോർസ് ഒരു ബർത്ത്ഡേ പാർട്ടി വരെ ഞാൻ ഉറപ്പായിട്ട് ഞാൻ വരാം ഞാൻ മാക്സിമം വരാം I don't know how you maximum it up. <laughs> they come maximum. I don't know how they do that. They maximum it up. Okay. So, they, so obviously the maximum means no. Because I, when I released my book, I was gauging my responses. I could have done a study based on the responses I got. You maximum try out. I'm like, great. Yeah, great. Okay. Maximum try out. So, when they see you, they'll be like, oh, I'm going to be like, why don't you say it? Sorry, it wasn't convenient for me. End of story. So again there's a lot of culture it's a deep topic but never lie Suppose you're late for work one day and you overslept you don't want to say that you know you you know your fa- father was visiting or you had another appointment see I overslept they'll be very happy especially when you're abroad In fact they value honesty more than any any other commodity and uh, I know it for sure right So if you made a mistake to say this this is what happened and i believe this is an error i apologize for it i'll make sure it will not happen again end of story you try to cover up you try to you know do the typical malayali thing it's somebody else that did it no if you made a mistake just own up end of story they don't really hold it against you you must know local culture and sport very important if you if you go to america if you don't know baseball if you don't know the local football team that is you know american football you know what you may not really sync well with them so you just have to do your homework just study a little bit about local culture again this comes easily to people in our country we break laws all the time <laughs> all the time i mean i don't want to even get into that so never break the law you will struggle be prepared there will be pain there will be pain there will be poverty there will be suffering kevin thank you what matters in your career about as in india is who you know and who knows you you may be a very smart doctor smart researcher but if you don't have the right mentor you may not necessarily reach the right spots people need to be present at the right places to push you in the right direction so try to find good mentors and get research done if if you're planning a career abroad get a couple of papers right now because dr george chandi anything is possible right okay 100% 100% with yourself as well as other people no lying no dilly dallying nothing be direct and never ever big down do not go to america and criticize their politics take sides or talk about their religion no religion is a no no we don't talk about religion and again i teach about social media again if you if you work on social media never ever comment on religion sex or politics in india you don't you don't want to do that because one man's right is always another person's wrong so stay away from that and don't think you'll become wealthy just because you went abroad no you become wealthy only if you are in for the long haul and if you really really rough it out right so being abroad does not bring wealth so if any of you are going abroad with that concept you know, remember why is it that because to start earning in america you'll spend a minimum of 6 years in poverty i've done that and soon after that i came back so that's my story but i'm telling you if you go abroad it doesn't mean that you're going to make money and then you got to i know all of you are good english speakers i think ram told me that but I'll tell you a couple of things you got to work on our pronunciation indians generally have to work on our pronunciation let's go through the exercise how do you say this word can anyone pronounce this how does the average malayali say about how about department <laughs> department there apartment see that a pa r t m e n t all are equal right they break it down into malayalam words malayalam syllables and then say apartment <coughs> but actually it is it's pronounced how apartment it's a part so in english every word has a graph whereas in malayalam or hindi all all, uh, all syllables are equal can you see that can you see it from there 
So for every English word, frustratingly, it's actually quite frustrating. Because you can never get your diction right all the time. So, we say people, people, how many people were in the room? It's actually people. The first part is very strong and the second part tails out. So, it's people. Example, for example. <laughs> So there's an exam and a pull with that. No. It's actually example. The exam actually comes strong. So if you really hear from a distance, you only hear the exam part. For example, now this is that's a stress word. Table. This is a table. Actually, it's a table. So the T A Y is very strong, and the bill actually is very soft. Table. It's a table. Oh, don't even get started with this one. Especially. If you're from North India, comfortable. Are you very comfortable? So it is come for a table. Did you come for a table? No. Yes. Are you comfortable?